Hello there, sword friends. Today I'm going to tell you about this sword right here. It is an S7 katana from a company called Dragon Sword. And before I get into the review, some quick notes that you should hear at the start. One, it's a review sample. It was sent to me for free. If you think that makes me biased, you know, at the start. And two, I study Japanese swordsmanship and I talk a lot about swords in particular katana, but I don't fancy myself an expert in the subject. So keep that in mind as you hear my, my musings and ramblings throughout this video. The other thing that you should know probably at the start is that this sword was $540 and I say was because unfortunately when I try to look it up on Dragon Sword's website, nothing comes up. So I don't know if it's no longer available, if they're just out and plan on making more. I'm not sure what the status is of this sword, but it was sent to me for review. I've pushed it all the way to failure, so I figure I might as well share it with you. In particular because it held up really well, I think. Spoiler alert, people that want a durable sword are likely gonna like it. Anyway, uh, on, on with the review inning. All right, so as I do, I will start with the pommel, the end cap, the kashra right here, this little bit. Now you can see in the sword that I am holding the sword is broken, but the kashra is still there. Unfortunately, I got video of the sword while it was still in one piece. And the kashra is a little bit of a miss for me. So one, the casting detail is not necessarily bad here. I can make out individual bulbs of the nanako. That's this little kind of pattern, this little uh, stippled texture that's on the surface of the steel. Stippled is not the right word, but this little kind of raised dome in, in a very small pattern on the surface of the steel. And I can make them out individually. The casting quality seems okay. I can clearly make out its cast. Now, typically on some of these kashra, you will make out uh, casting lines, seams, tool marks. And fortunately, I don't really see any of those. But the stippling, or the, the nanako as it's called, it, or nanako would be what it was if it was done by hand, but this cast pattern is really only on the top. And the sides are bare and look somewhat unfinished. It's met with a small raised rim around the base. It adds a little bit of texture and dimension, but the kind of the fact that the patterning just stops around the end is a little jarring to my eye and I can't say that I like it. I do like this kind of striped shittodome uh, that is on the that's this little raised washer area made out of brass. A lot of times these are spiky, and it seems like everyone buys them from the same supplier. Uh, whatever Dragon Sword is doing, these look a little different, a little nicer, well put in, and also not spiky and don't hurt my hand. The transitions were slightly bunchy, but overall really excellent uh, to, to the Ito. When it, was, <laughs> when it was in one piece, everything transitioned really well. There weren't any ledges to speak of. It's it's a little bunchy if I'm being very, very particular about it, but overall I thought the, the Idomaki and how it lined up and transitioned were, were really quite good for a sword in this price point. Now $540 is not the cheapest sword out there, but it's um, just barely kind of in the middle range territory, and the fact that you can get it for 540 bucks and have nice Ito is is a pleasant thing. I think Dragon Sword charges a little bit more for nice Ito. They used to have, and I can't see because I can't get on their website right now to see this particular sword, but it used to be like 60 extra dollars if you wanted really nicely done Ito, and it was a recommended feature upgrade if, if they had it. I don't know why they wouldn't just put it on all their swords, but I can imagine if you don't really care, plan on wrapping it yourself, or will, will would rather lacquer it and spend $60 less, that you might not want to spend the time to have somebody do a really nice job on it. But anyway, I think this one was had that service done on it, and I'm guessing it was in the 540 bucks because it looked really, really nice and tight, which brings us to the rest of the handle. So the handle was slender and nice, and the Ito was tight and uh, not not tight in the supreme, most excellent way. Now, Ito, in terms of tightness, I've, I've said it like, but if I could take all my, if I could stand on my finger and put all of my weight on one of the knots, it wouldn't move. That would be how tight it would be in a perfect world. And there are some swords that achieve that. Very, very few of them, but, uh, and certainly none that I've, I've seen in $540 price point, but it, it, it can be done, it just doesn't tend to get done on mass production swords or inexpensive swords. But this is, is pretty close. It doesn't move around. It, it has very, very little displacement. I have to push really hard to get any of the knots to move. I thought overall the Ito was tight. The diamonds were also relatively consistent. There was a little bit of variation in it, but they weren't terrible. And so uh, the shaping of the handle as well, it indexed well, it felt good in my hand, it didn't move easily in my hand. Uh, I liked the, the general shaping. I'm not sure to what degree they added in the extra service. Like I said, sometimes they would charge $60 to have additional or nicer Idomaki, but I, I suspect this is here because it seemed overall um, an order of magnitude better than I'm used to seeing on $500 swords. The other bit to note about the handle is it did break, so you can see here it is it is broken. That is not a super common thing to happen, but do know that it happened while I was throwing it at a tree. So. <laughs> 
it, it eventually did break. It took a lot to break it, though, and it stayed on there and in one piece, which, it, to, to its credit, it didn't fly off and come un, you know, unfrazzled and like, continue with the testing, despite the fact that Kashra had more or less broken off, and the Nikago uh, ends roughly right here, and so this little bit is, doesn't have a, a metal tang seated in it, and it, it broke off, um, but I could continue using the weapon, and I didn't lose it, which is surprising, honestly. Uh, other bits to note is that there are some Agawa panels in here. They have relatively small nodules. That's not necessarily a bad thing. It'd be nice to see uh, a little nicer skin on there, but honestly, it's not something that you spend a lot of time looking at. It's nice if it's there, but it's not really that big a deal. I'd also love to see them do full wraps, because if this was fully wrapped around, I'd venture a guess that this handle may not have broken or would have held, it, would have held together even better. The uh, Manuki that are in here are relatively small. You can kind of see the profile of the, the handle doesn't change drastically, so they didn't pick really big bulbousy Manuki that make the knots kind of harder to, to tie and misplace. The casting quality on them is okay. Uh, better, better than average, I would say, but nothing uh, particularly special. There's a single bamboo peg that runs through here. I don't see a second Makugi, but a single Makugi on here and there. They've done some attention to detail on the Makugi itself. Uh, it looks like it's it's well prepared. It's not doesn't look like it's made out of a chopstick, and it held together through all the testing, despite the fact the handle may have may have broken in other ways. Uh, it tells me that they spent a little bit of time on some of the smaller nuanced details here, and it's a it's a small thing, but something I, I certainly appreciate seeing. The other bits. Um, where dresses are where it meets the fuchi up here is also really good there is no no problems with the ito this was overall i thought a really nicely executed handle uh, obviously i wasn't a fan of, of some of the the patterning on the kashra but overall it felt good in the hand and the ito felt really tight it held up really well it didn't rattle it's it's put together in such a way that you can disassemble it for cleaning it held together through all the abusive testing or at least the whole handle didn't come off obviously this this broke um and the ito stayed stayed on there it shows you the benefit of of tight ito or well done ito even though the handle cracked like this thing is still on here and you can still grab it and use it as a weapon anyway i thought the handle was generally well executed if I move up to this Fuchi fitting up here, it has the same pattern as on the top of the Kashra. It looks a little bit more complete. Uh, there is one small area of tool marking over here, but it's subtle. You have to kind of really look at it, and it didn't start to uh, patinate. It's the some tool markings on either side where the pattern is disrupted slightly. Um, I didn't say that I wouldn't say that I really noticed these until after I was using it quite a bit. I did practice with this through the seasons, you might say. I gave this one a a few months of time to train with, and um, and so I used it quite a bit. And some of this patterning on the on the fitting here, and a little bit on the kashra, it's covered with dirt <laughs> right now, so it's tough to tell what's from use and what's from uh, what's from abuse. But on the fuchi, you can kind of see where my finger rubbed some of the patina off. Uh, not drastic or bad, but worth worth noting it's there. Anyway, uh, appeal of the Fuchi aesthetically is a little better, and the tool markings are minor. A lot of these cast fittings have kind of egregious tool markings that look like one side of it or one face of it is just sanded off, and here the, the attempt at making it nicer is at least a little bit more present. Um, there's, there's some imperfection, but it's not, not as egregious as I've seen on other swords at this price point. Uh, it's also worth noting that there are swords that do it better. Skyjiro, uh, Hanwei, both of those brands have like some specially made fittings. Dragon King, I would guess, falls into that as well, and their fittings tend to have fewer tool markings and be a little, a little bit nicer than this, uh, even at the $500 price point. But at the same time, I wouldn't say that these are these are too bad. It's got a nice suba. Um, I don't make out as many imperfection kind of things in the in the suba itself, and overall, it's held up well. It seems to mesh with the overall aesthetic and theme pretty well. If I move up from the Suba, it has a uh, habaki that is made of copper, and this habaki has uh, really gone through it. The spine of the habaki has started to peel back. <laughs> the sword was abused really aggressively, but the habaki is still on there. The blade, it doesn't go in the scabbard all the way because it's it started to peel back from, from being tossed at trees and hit into hit into metal poles and stuff like that. But uh, it's, it's an interesting thing. Topper habaki seem to do this more than brass ones. It seems like the copper, while I appreciate the look a little bit more, is a little softer and uh, I see more cracked or peeled hibaki than in copper than, than I, do, I do in brass. And they seem to be about the same size. So anyway, uh, I like the look of the copper hibaki. It didn't hold up to the 
abuse as well as, as some other swords have, uh, or other habaki have, but it still looked really nice, it fit really nice, and while I was doing EI with it, it fit the scabbard well and overall did what it was supposed to do in providing tension around the Kweguchi area, uh, the mouth of the scabbard, and it it provided tension in there, it drew, it held up pretty well, and again, I tested this like in really, really cold, dry times in winter, and then some, some more humid times in the summer. Uh, this sword went through its paces, and the tension on it was always, always pretty good. Now, this is a part that will wear over time. If you use it a lot, you're going to have to shim it or something like that. I didn't end up having to do it, but I, I was impressed that it held up as well as it did and uh, was as nice as it was. Moving on from there, we have the scabbard, and the scabbard has this kind of cracked black over red looking you know, theme. I've seen it on a lot of swords. What's a little bit different about this is that they make some thinner scabbards, and this has been consistent on the dragon swords that I've seen. Uh, this one thickens up down here, tapers down a little bit towards the end, and that is, that is a nice feature. It feels a little bit more delicate in the hand, but it also feels a little bit more elegant in the hand. So this one is probably not going to hold up as well to abuse as some other thicker, more robust scabbards, but it's a little bit more in line with what I would see on, on actual Japanese swords, and it's a small nuanced attention to detail that I, I appreciate seeing here. Um, I don't know how much, I don't think there's horn koi, koiguchi or kojiri on here, and I don't think the kurigata is horn, I think it's wood. So the, the scabbard itself, while it has some tapering, the rest of the parts on it are not uh, not terribly expensive or, or nice. The shitadome on here, these little washer areas, didn't come out. They seem to be glued in, which was a nice touch, but they're a different style than what is featured on the, the kasha up here. It'd be nice if they were, if they were similar. Uh, the Sageo came with matched reasonably well. Aesthetically, I, you know, this is a review sample, so I'm not complaining too much. It's not necessarily what I would have chosen, but I think overall it blends well and it seems to make an overall handsome sword. Now the blade, the pointy pointy stabby part, obviously this one is no longer with us. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, the, yeah, <laughs> it's not, it's seen better days. Um, I could probably turn this into some sort of weird wakizashi of some kind, but uh, I don't I don't know what the plans are for this one. But uh, in its time, before it was destroyed, it was a relatively simple shape. It didn't have uh, really much in the way of complex geometry. It came to me reasonably sharp. It could cut pool noodles apart, water bottles apart reasonably well. It cut mats reasonably well. It could be sharper. It could be a little bit more refined and a little bit more geared to cut soft targets or harder targets. Um, but harder targets, now that I mentioned it, seemed to, to hold up pretty well. It didn't diminish substantially in terms of edge when I cut logs and timber and, you know, uh, various branches and things like that. It seemed to hold up to those tasks. I also cut some uh, large cardboard tubes, and the edge overall really didn't seem to, to diminish, at least not in a way that I found meaningful or substantial. If I then brought it back to pool noodles, it, it had a very similar performance. It didn't seem to lose the bite that was there. At the same time, it could be more refined, it could be sharper, and if you have the capability of doing it, the polish on it is not substantial. It, it has more or less a mirror polish on it, um, and the lines, the, the shinogi and whatnot, are somewhat soft, so you could maybe mirror polish it again if you if you have the patience and time and skill to do that, but it's not as hard to get as some of the other Japanese style polishes. Anyway, um, the shape was Shinogi Zakuri. The lines were okay, the geometry was all right. It just, there wasn't any specific bohi horimono or like uh, a polish that brought out characteristics in the steel. It was a very shiny mirror polished blade uh, without a hamon. It's a through hardened S7 blade. That's what it's supposed to be made of. I say supposed to because I have no way of validating it. Um, what I can do though is push it to failure and tell you if that S7 steel is is doing anything remarkable or special. Now you may note that it's broken now, so it's not indestructible, um, but when I went to actually cut stuff with it, it did, it did end up lasting longer. I'll, I'll get to that in just a moment though. Finishing up on the blade, uh, it had a Yakote that was kind of polished in. You could make out some semblance of it. It was overall just a pretty simple blade, though. And unfortunately, a lot of people like me to talk about the blade and all the little nuances of it. And there's just not much to talk about here. There's no hamon. There's no hada. Uh, the lines are relatively soft. There's no bohi. There's an attempt at a yakote. It overall was reasonably sharp. It had a, you know, no secondary bevel or anything particularly egregious on there that would draw your attention, but it's it's relatively simple in appearance and doesn't have any features that are uncommon to, to find on swords. But it also, 
did all the things that it was supposed to do. It was sharp, it had <laughs> had all the lines that you would expect to see in a Japanese-style sword, it drew and sheathed appropriately, and when I was when talking about moving it around, uh, I did a fair amount of EI with it, and it was always a fine tool. It was a little bit on the top-heavy side, measurements and all that kind of stuff are in the description down below if you're interested. I would say it felt substantial in the hand. It wasn't necessarily a particularly heavy sword, but at the same time, it, it felt like it would have a little bit of authority in the cut. Um, it wouldn't be my first choice for training with EI a lot because it, it did have kind of a tip-heavy feel to it. Not in an egregious way though, and cutting with it, it was perfectly fine. And I would say that it, it does most things well. It wasn't so heavy that I couldn't train for hours if I had to, just wouldn't be my preference. And it wasn't uh, so wide that it really did all the work for me in cutting, but it also was a little bit uh, authoritative in the cut. It did, you know, to Tommy mats and stuff easier than I might have expected a sword like this to do. And so it was, it, it's, if you're, if you want one sword to do all the different things, you only want to buy one, then a sword in this size and with this profile may be a worthy choice because it's not so robust. You can't train with it for hours, um, but it's not uh, so, so beefy that it does all the work for you in like a competitive cutting scenario. To be a little bit more specific, this sword is two pounds, eight ounces. Typically that's somewhere in the middle lightweight side of things. It's, it's around average, but a lot of times swords at two pounds, eight ounces can feel a little bit more lively in the hand. This one is a higher point of balance. There's a little bit more weight out at the tip. There's a little less distal taper in there as well, which explains some of that. And the handle is um, smaller. It doesn't have a, a big long handle or heavy fittings to, to balance it out on the other side. So the point of balance is a little higher and that is probably contributing to the more weighty tip feeling that I'm, ex I'm experiencing here. But do know it doesn't feel bad. I'm not, I'm not complaining. It's a little bit more forward. If that's something that bothers you, then this would not necessarily be a good choice for you. But if you don't really mind it, it wasn't egregious or terrible to train with. I was happy to do it. Now, moving on to the cutting side of things, I cut many things over a long period of time. So I cut water bottles and pool noodles and time mats and uh, I, I cut branches and I cut uh, cardboard tubes and shaving cream cans and beer cans and all, all manner of different targets. And to just elaborate a little bit on some of them and cutting pool noodles and water bottles, I wouldn't say that this was something that just wowed me. It cut through them. Um, if I did my technique right, it, it did it reasonably well. It was sharp enough to do them without without problem, but I wouldn't say it was so sharp that it just kind of popped the noodles apart and really, really wowed me or impressed me with the sharpness. It has a profile that could get there if you have the skill to do it, and I imagine just a few passes or maybe more than a few passes with like a ceramic rod would probably get it in the area that I'd, I'd want it to be. But it was sufficient to do that and in an area where even, even somebody without a huge amount of skill could probably get it to the level of sharpness that would excel at those types of activities. Uh, for tatami, it popped those apart reasonably well. It wasn't a bad sword to cut tatami with. It wasn't the easiest one out there either, um, but it, it certainly did the activity reasonably well. It was fun to train with. I, I cut a few different mats with it, and overall, I would say it's fun. Some of the mats that I cut are really hard to cut, and it, it did them reasonably well. So I was overall... Uh, there, there wasn't anything that really wowed me about the cutting, but there also wasn't anything that made me say this isn't going to do the job well. It certainly did the job of cutting Tatami well. I cut some very hard mats uh, with a, a very not particularly skilled person behind the wheel. So uh, it's, it's sufficient in that activity as well. Uh, where it started to wow me is in some of the more abusive stuff. So in really aggressively cutting wood and branches, the fact that it didn't dull and could still go back and cut Tatami and bottles and that kind of stuff after being kind of aggressive into wood was impressive to me. Not a lot of swords can do that. Uh, well, some can, but many, many don't or will dull or diminish more than this one seemed to. Uh, further, when I went to go do really dumb abusive stuff and started throwing it at a tree or hitting it directly into a tree, um, it seemed to hold up reasonably well. It didn't take a bend, at least not a lot. This one did take a set slightly after taking it to uh, the tree and throwing it at it and then bring it and slapping it on the side of the tree or my stand really hard It would bend slightly But it really took a lot of effort to get it to bend even a little bit slightly and then it would You know, I could I could bend it back, but it was also rather loath to bend back It kept its shape really really well It didn't deform easily and it held up to some of those really abusive things that you've seen other swords fail at uh, Quite a bit better than most now and throwing it at a tree the uh, the kashra area did break eventually um, the <laughs> the uh, habaki you know diminished it it hit and like jarred the the habaki quite a bit at one point um, but it all still held up as a weapon i could still use it i could still swing it i could still thrust with it i thrust the tip as well into like an old appliance that i found 
that somebody had buried in my yard before I moved in. Anyway, different story. Uh, the tip also held up reasonably well. So across all the testing, I want to point out that uh, I'm really happy with how well it's holding up. It doesn't bend particularly easy. It seems to hold its, ed hold its edge pretty well. And even though the, the condition of it is diminishing, being thrown at a tree, uh, the kasha breaking, not great. I'd love to see the tang extended a little bit more. I'd love to see a full wrap of Ito, but it's not inappropriate. Uh, throwing it at a tree is not a consistent thing for me. Sometimes they hit in weird areas. This one, I think, hit right on the kasha and it broke. I venture, I guess, that this is not an uncommon thing that could happen, despite the fact it doesn't tend to happen to me. But a lot of times when I'm throwing it, I miss the tree. So uh, it's it's a relatively inconsistent test. I, I'm actually impressed that when it broke, it kind of held together and held held up as much as it did, where it's still like I can find the pieces and the etos tight. And some of those things are, are really showing, showing why they're important. Um, the other bit is I brought up the croquet steak of doom. And this is a test that is not good right like this is in, it's not going to survive <laughs> um and hitting and hitting it on the croquet steak of doom there's some important things to note here and one is what i feel uh i can hit it it's it doesn't like shock me in my other hand though so if i hold the second hand it's easier for me to do in one i can protect more of my body so i tend to swing it with one hand but i can do it with two and it doesn't hurt my hands it doesn't vibrate and shock my second hand which is a lot of times what happens when I swing at the croquet stick of doom, some swords just are really aggressive and it hurts if I try to swing with two hands. This one did not. It really absorbed it and favored being used with two hands. Uh, it also held up to the croquet stick of doom exceptionally well. So when I was hitting it, I diminished the sword. Um, I struck it on one end, reversed it, struck it on the, the spine. Eventually it did break, okay, but it took way more strikes to get to break than many swords have. Oftentimes, uh, I don't have to flip a sword to the opposite side and strike the spine to break it on the croquet stick of doom. So ne needing to be flipped on the spine is, is an accomplishment in and of itself. But often it takes one or two kind of lazy strikes to break the sword after I start hitting it on its spine after I've diminished the edge. And this one, I really had to lean into it and hit harder. By contrast, I was testing the scorpion swords, a much beefier and softer <laughs> beefcake of the sword. And that one broke in a, in a few kind of lazy strikes on the spine. Still an accomplishment to make it to that level of testing, but this one, I really had to lean into it and hit, hit on the spine quite hard in order to diminish it enough to, to break. So um, I can't tell you for sure if this is made from S7, but I can tell you that whatever it's made out of, it held up really, really well to the type of abusive testing that I do in these videos. At this point, sword friends, you have seen me talk about the bits and bobs and fits and features and show you them in great detail. Hopefully it gives you some idea of what to expect if you buy something from Dragon Sword. You've also seen me move it around and talk about it as a practitioner. You have seen me cut things both reasonable and unreasonable. And hopefully it's enough to decide if it's worth your hard-earned money or not, should Dragon Sword choose to release this sword again. Uh, but it's time for me to answer the question myself. Do I think it's worth the $540 asking price? And the short answer is yes. The long answer is yes, both on the front of a train tool if you don't mind necessarily the point of balance and how this one seems to lay out as well as like very very durable swords if you're the kind of person that wants an exceptionally durable strong sword that's gonna survive the zombie apocalypse and that kind of stuff and this is a very forgiving sword and among the well it's certainly on the short list of the most durable katana that I have tested in my time so um, yes I, I thought it held up really really well to some of the abusive testing I also thought it was nice to train with I thought the Ito was tight and a lot of the little nuances were, were addressed. If you're gonna do training with it, if you're practicing with it as a Japanese swordsmanship practitioner, I might recommend you ask them to put a nicer scabbard on that has horn bits and has a little bit more attention to detail there. I think it'll enhance the experience in a meaningful way. If you're not though, then the scabbard that it comes with is fine and it's certainly a very, very durable sword. It seemed to hold up really, really well to all the testing that I did. I didn't really start to notice edge defamation until I was whacking it on a metal pole a little bit, from some of the cans that I was cutting. It certainly scratched and diminished the, the polish on the blade, but I didn't really notice any issues with the edge until I started doing some, some significant stuff. There were minor chips from like the, the shaving pin cans and stuff, but uh, very, very minor overall. And edge defamation on the croquet stake of doom is par for the course. There's, there isn't a sword that I've tested that I've been able to whack the croquet stake of doom with in a meaningful way and have it come back without, without some sort of edge defamation on it. So anyway, exceptionally durable, on the short list of some of the most durable that I've tested. Also, really excellent fit and finish for the money. Uh, I think there, there's two areas here that this sword is excelling, um, and, and hopefully that 
explains why I think it's worth it. Yeah, if, if you value either of those things, then I would say it's it's worthy of consideration. So anyway, that's all I've got. If you're interested, Dragon Sword's website will be linked down below. Uh, I know they offer a bunch of different stuff. I don't see this one on there. Hopefully they decide to release it again, because if you value durability, this one... <laughs> This one was very impressive in that regard, but I'd imagine the levels of fit and finish that you see on this one are, are likely to be replicated on some of the other offerings that they have if they interest you. Anyway, that's all I got. Cheers, and thanks for watching.